Last year, when I was, as they say, traveling abroad in the Basque region of Spain, I ate as much of their burnt cheesecake as I could so that I could come back to the US feeling better equipped to develop my own version of this classic recipe. And after eating many, many versions of this cheesecake, I now feel like I have some strong opinions about how to get this thing right. So today I'm gonna show you guys how to recreate the silky textures and caramely flavors of the best burnt Basque cheesecake I ate in Spain. To get started, I'll need room temperature ingredients. Baking this cake with stuff that's right out of the fridge will lead to a cheesecake that is underbaked AF. To prove it, I baked a room temperature and a fridge temperature cheesecake. This is the cold cheesecake. The center and the bottom aren't cooked that much, or at all. That's because this cake bakes at a very high temperature and the outside gets burnt well before the ice cold middle has warmed up enough to start cooking. It's not bad, but it's very wet. For your reference, here's the cheesecake made with tempered ingredients. The texture is godly, trust me. Now before I mix, I'll just preheat my oven to 475F, then grab my stand mixer. Into the bowl of that goes 800 grams of cream cheese, then 225 grams of goat cheese. Goat cheese isn't traditional for this cheesecake, but the mild twang and acidity that it adds takes it from very good to downright frickin' remarkable. Sub in extra cream cheese if you ain't got no goat. In that goes, then 350 grams of sugar, the paddle attachment goes on, then I'll mix this on low speed to cream together the cheese and the sugar. Right away, the cream cheese will get all gunked up on the paddle, so after about a minute, I'll scrape down the sides to get things combined evenly, and then I'll keep on mixing. I wanna mix this until the sugar and cream cheese have become one thing. That'll take about three to four minutes on low speed. And once that's been gently combined, I'll grab five large eggs, and then with the mixer running on low speed, once again, I'll glug those in one at a time. As I drop these eggs, I'll let them get folded in all the way, then I'll lazily drop in my next one. Also, resist the temptation to speed up this whole mix by turning up the mixer speed. That's gonna whip air into the mixture here, making the cake puff a lot in the oven. That sounds kinda like a good thing, but at the temperature that we're baking this cake, excessive souffleing will make the top brown way before the middle is done cooking. Speaking of excessive souffleing, how about all this excessive snacking I've been doing on Catalina Crunch, the sponsor of this video. You guys, my snacking cannot be controlled. I wouldn't say that I have a problem per se, but delicious, salty, crunchy snacks that taste as good as Catalina Crunch Mix does don't stand a chance in my pantry. But the good news is that when I'm eating the entire bag of Catalina Crunch Mix, I know that it's actually a healthier choice than a lot of the other snacks that I could be eating. Catalina Crunch is low carb, high fiber, and it has five to eight grams of protein per serving. It comes in four flavors, all good. Spicy Kick, Creamy Ranch, cheddar, and my current favorite, traditional. Not pictured because Catalina Crunch sent me this three days ago and I can't be stopped. So if you're a real snack head like me, I highly recommend you give Catalina Crunch Mix a try. Head to catalinacrunch.com slash Lagerstrom and use code Lagerstrom at checkout and you'll get 15% off your first order plus free shipping, or you can pick it up at your local grocery store. And now that I'm done filming this ad, I'm gonna eat the rest of this Crunch Mix. And once my eggs are all mixed in, I'll scrape down the sides to make sure things are getting evenly combined and at this point, the batter should look kind of like snack pack vanilla pudding. Next, I'll add in five grams of salt, then grab 500 grams of heavy cream and stream that in with the mixer running on low speed. I'm baking this cake about 50 to 75 degrees hotter than most other American recipes that I've seen. So I'm skewing my wet ingredients towards cream instead of eggs. If there's too many eggs at high temperatures, that will lead to a curdled scrambled egg texture that's not very Basque. And once I'm all creamed up, of course, I'll give this another scrape down to ensure homogenous is texture, then I'll grab a fine mesh strainer and add in 50 grams of all-purpose flour. Since this is such a small amount of flour, you don't really need the gluten, and you could easily sub in a cup-for-cup gluten-free flour to make this recipe lorn-friendly. Now, I'll give this one last spin for about two minutes on low speed to evenly hydrate that flour, and then, of course, one last scrape down to make sure anything stuck to the sides gets combined with everything else. The final texture of this batter should be smooth, creamy, and slightly thick. Now to bake this thing, I'll grab a nine inch springform pan. If you don't have a springform though, you can still play ball, of course. Just grab a nine by 13 metal brownie pan, pan spray the hell out of it, and then add in your batter. Because this is a different form factor from the round, the bake time and the final result will be slightly different, but I'll explain how in just a second. Now to prep this spring form for baking, I'll cut a square of parchment that's bigger than the round on the bottom of the pan. Next, I'll trace a circle around it so I've got a perfectly sized round outline 
Then I'll cut out that circle going just inside the line so that it fits inside the pan. Next, I'll rip out a 30-ish inch length of parchment paper. Then I'll zip it in half real quick, making it about six to eight inches tall. Then I'll close the spring on the round part of the pan, load in the paper vertically, and then adjust it so that it's exactly the circumference of the pan. Hmm. There we go. Next, I'll staple the top real quick to fix the sides together. Then I'll flip it over and staple it again on the bottom. Now to put this all together, I'll spray the spring form liberally with pan spray, then drop in my bottom piece of paper, then the cylinder around the sides, then I'll spray the paper itself liberally to make sure the cheesecake batter doesn't stick. Now the spring form goes on a sheet tray, then I'll load in all of my cheesecake batter and then load this sheet tray into my 475F oven to bake for 40 minutes. Halfway through this 40 minute bake, I'll come back Back and check my progress. Nice rise, a little bit of color, but it's still blonde. So I'll rotate the sheet tray 180 degrees for even cooking, and then I'll give this another 15 to 20 minutes of baking, depending on your oven. And after 40 minutes, this cheesecake is officially burnt in a good way. To determine doneness here, I'll give the sheet tray a little shimmy. I want it jiggly, but not wet, and that looks ideal. As far as color goes, don't hesitate to bake this very dark. It's called burnt cheesecake for a reason. It needs that caramelization on the outside to taste the way it should. For now, I'll set this cheesecake aside and cool it down for about two to four hours before I cut into it. Back to that brownie pan cheesecake. To bake it properly, I cooked it at 425F for 35 minutes, then broiled the top for three to five minutes to finish burning the top. This version of the cheesecake is not as good as the round one because the variation of texture isn't as pronounced, but it's still a very good tasting cheesecake that's stupidly easy to make and profoundly crowd pleasing. And after a good long cool down, our original cheesecake is ready to remove from its spring form pan. Oh my God. You can see it's got like 20 different shades of golden brown going on. And it's even got some truly burnt espresso-y chocolatey flavors around the edges to keep you guessing. The inside of the cake is just as important as the outside though. There's a spectrum of texture from silky and velvety in here, all the way to fully set custom and almost fudgy. You guys, this cake is a study in contrast. Bright and lively on the inside and it's dark and brooding on the outside. Every single emotion is buried somewhere inside this cake. Oh my God, that is psychotic. I know I use the word creamy a lot to describe foods, but this literally is the creamiest. The flavor of the burnt part is really special. It tastes kind of like caramel and vanilla but it's just eggs, sugar, and cheese. There's nothing else going on there, but it's incredibly intense and complex. It's so good. If you guys wanna take a crack at my New York style cheesecake recipe, then I'll link to that video right here. That one is also great because, you know, it's cheesecake, but it's super different from this one. And I think I'm glad to have both styles in my life. I'll see you there.